recording started. Hi, everybody, and thank you for attending today's event. My name is Matt LeBrake, and along with Ruth Slagle, we co-chair the ACRL Distance and Online Learning Section Instruction Committee. This event is titled Learning Objects in Action, and will feature four presentations from our virtual poster session that was held last April. With 30 digital posters attracting more than 7,000 visitors and 50,000 page views over the course of a week, the poster session reached a wide global audience of librarians. So for today's event, we invited back a series of presenters who received positive feedback and high levels of engagement in the poster session to talk more in depth about their projects. From accessibility to learning outcomes, learning management system integrations to assessment, these topics are sure to be relevant and timely for anyone supporting online instruction this year. So the way this event is gonna flow is that each of the presenters will have five to seven minutes to present, followed by five minutes for Q&A. So ask your questions in the chat as you think of them and they will be relayed to the presenter at the end of each session. We don't have time for all questions. The presenters will follow up in writing and the answers will be shared with everyone along with the recording of this event. Uh, before we get started, I wanna quickly plug the ACRL distance and online learning section and encourage you all to get involved. Uh, the charge of the instruction committee is to create professional development opportunities for librarians interested in teaching and learning online uh, like this one. However, there are many committees focused on standards, research and publications, networking, communication awards and more, all that re rely on volunteers like you to function. Uh, the call for participation occurs each December, so keep your eyes out. And now let's turn it over to our first presenters, Samantha Harlow and Rachel Olson from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, who will be presenting Creating New Online Research Tutorials, Flexible Skills and Connecting to Student Learning Outcomes. Hi, thank you so much, Matt and everybody with DOLS. This is Rachel. I'm going to turn on my captions. Please let me know if you can see my screen and the captions. Somebody just yell out. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, great. So I am Rachel Olson um, from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and my colleague Sam Harlow um, is also at UNCG. We're going to be talking to you today about this tutorial project and right now I've got the link to these slides up. So if you would like to follow along with what we're doing, um, you can definitely take advantage of that. I believe Sam's also going to be dropping it into the chat. So i um, looking forward to telling you about our project. So um, this tutorial project began uh, more than a year ago. It predates COVID, even though it's come in handy given COVID. Um, we have some student learning outcomes that were developed by our information literacy coordinator at UNCG, Jenny Dale. And she designed these outcomes um, using a couple different things, including the information literacy framework from ACRL. She also surveyed librarians and archivists who do instruction at UNCG um, in order to get our feedback and kind of use those, both of those things to develop um, the outcomes. There are five of them, five categories, find, evaluate, use, credit, and create. Um, and we will, uh, you'll see how they kind of fit into our tutorials, but that was sort of the basis for the design. So when we were doing tutorial planning, um, one of the big pieces of this project was collaboration and making sure that we were all on the same page, everyone knows what's going on. So Trello was a tool, Sam created this um, this Trello board. We really took advantage of it. Uh, I think it was heavily used, it still is heavily used. Um, and you can see here, each of the five categories of SLO has its own Trello board where you have underneath um, the specific modules that go in it. So those five SLOs form the tutorials themselves. Each one of these subtopics forms a module within that tutorial. So um, we could talk about Trello later if you have any questions about it, but it really did help us in terms of workflow, making sure that we were all clear about where each tutorial was in the planning process um, to avoid confusion. Uh, like I said, you understand tutorials are made up of modules, um, and it is important to note that we designed this in collaboration with our electronic resources and information technology folks at the library. Um, and there is opening language in each module that explains to users kind of a little bit of this background. There was a template for writing module content. Um, Sam and Jenny designed it. Basically, the idea was if you decided you wanted to create a tutorial module, um, you would use two to four student learning objectives um, for each one to try to make sure you know we weren't um, too too broad. Uh, and the uh, excuse me, we have different pages within modules. I'm sorry, my dog decided to bark. Um, 
uh, no more than 300 words per page and at least five pages with a visual on each one. And Sam could talk more than I could about H5P. Um, we did use that as sort of an interactive plugin sort of system. And Sam is going to talk to you about promotion and access. So hello, uh, this is Sam. Um, okay, the CC is working. So uh, you can go to the next slide, Rachel. Um, we're just gonna quickly talk about promotion and access since we don't have much time. We did what probably most of y'all do at your institutions. We marketed through our li library liaisons, instructional technology consultants, uh, UNCG Online, and uh, which is our online division to help put online courses as well as um, putting it in newsletters and things like that. But we also made the web um, version of the modules available as modules within Canvas Commons. So Canvas is our LMS, and we put all of them in Canvas Commons as well. Um, exactly the same. And H5P works as well within Canvas um, because of the embed code nature. Um, so we did a various forms of assessment on them, um, as well as basic click counts. So these are numbers as of November 2020 of Canvas Commons downloads. So something to keep in mind is that this doesn't account for how large the classes are or how many students are touching the tutorials through Canvas Commons, but just a class downloading it. And these numbers do match up to our web analytics in terms of our most popular ones. So our most popular one is um, plagiarism um, because everyone who goes through an academic academic integrity violation at UNCG has to take that uh, module. It's always been our most popular research module. But right after that, you can see other ones like popular and scholarly sources, navigating the library website, um, and citation are also up there in terms of uh, highly used ones. So um, we also did something different. We have an LIS, Library and Information Science Department at UNCG, where we employ uh, interns uh, in our reference department to help us with our virtual chat services. So we had each of these interns go through each module within the tutorial and um, assess them, test them for us. So this helped us give us time it required to complete. It helped us because of how quickly we could churn these out. Um, it helps us find spelling errors and content clarification, make sure that other people who aren't librarians understand them before we release them to students. Um, and other feedback and comments. Uh, so they filled out a Google form and let us know. We also attached a Google form to the um, each module on the web platform as well as Canvas Commons. So we just recently added in a question asking if they're taking the modules within Canvas or our website platform. Um, and you can see here, most of them who are filling out this form at least are actually taking them in Canvas Commons, which makes us believe that it's being maybe have more heavily used in Canvas Commons at this time. You can also see that um, in terms of this module met my needs, uh, so far we're doing pretty well. I feel like an anonymous form where most students are saying five, because uh, as students mostly filling this out. And then future directions, just quickly, I know we're um, running out of time, is that um, because of the collaborative nature of these modules, we can quickly churn out um, that we can quickly produce them as Rachel was uh, telling you about our workflow. So just recently we made an APA and MLA one to do specific citation styles for disciplines, as well as integrating your sources in your writing to help with in-text citations. Uh, we lost access to one of our pro-con, like exploring multiple points of view databases. So quickly we could make a module on exploring multiple points of view that um, showed other um, databases to use. Uh, we have a suite of um, stuff about open educational resources that we just put out that we're adding to, as well as um, course specific stuff where we can take research uh, components and the student learning objectives and match them up to these large enrollment courses. Uh, and you can see here we have one for college writing and our communication studies, which so far in Canvas Commons have been downloaded a lot. And uh, other ones, right, or other departments can get involved. Scholarly communications uh, is one that we have coming up within tech services, primary sources with our special collections and archives, health science, as well as data. And uh, here are the tutorials that I will drop in chat. Uh, you know, in another world, I would uh, show them off a little bit, but uh, we only have a little bit of time and I think we're right at time. So that's it. So we're holding questions to the end. Right, Matt? Nope, we will take questions now after each session. Okay, cool. So I saw one came in about um, H5P. 
Um, and I saw that someone dropped it in the chat. So just a little bit about that is that it's a free open source uh, software that creates HTML5 um, programs. So the big thing is that it used to be free where you could just go on their website, sign up with any kind of email address and, um, you know, go to town building these HTML5 interactions, which are multiple choice. Um, you can do a full presentation with multiple choice, true or false drag and drop. Um, they're also very accessible for being HTML5 and interactive as well. Um, there's a full page on which of their interactions are accessible and what you need to do to make them accessible. Um, but um, their servers are running out with how popular they've become. So we did end up um, adding it to our servers through a WordPress plugin. So the WordPress plugin is free and we created a WordPress site through our IT department um, on, you know, so to put the interactions on the back end. So you can go right now and try out H5P um, at, on their website for free, but they will flash messages at you about um, it being uh, that you need to move it to your own server. So again, we use the WordPress plugin. Um, so someone asked, are your Canvas Commons modules available outside of UNCG? So that's a question we get a lot. So the, our settings at UNCG don't allow us to share outside of UNCG, um, but you they are identical to what is on the website. And that link I dropped to you shows you that we do have a Creative Commons license on them. So you're welcome to pull them into your own version of Canvas Commons um, and adapt them for your own institution as long as you credit us, because I'm pretty sure that's the kind of license we put it put on there. Um, and so, um, Lisa asked, uh, can you talk more about the Trello board and how you use it to organize things? Rachel, do you want to talk about that? I don't want to dominate. Yeah, that. sure. Um, the Trello board was something Sam created. So correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. But basically, we had each of the categories of like the tutorials for the SLOs. And with each one like under um, I can't think right now, but you would have a you would have a module listed and then we have color coded labels. So you had some that said like this one is core. We went through at the very beginning of this process and decided which ones were like the most uh, urgently needed or which ones we wanted to prioritize for creating. Um, and then after that, we um, had labels like in progress or when Sam had finished putting it on the website platform, she would label it there. And then I would label it once it was in Canvas. We have a done column, which is really gratifying to be able to move one into the done column. Um, things like that. So it's uh, we were able to use the free version of Trello. Trello will also try to get you to sign up for the paid version, but you totally don't need it for this. Um, and somebody asked if we could set, like share a public version of it. Um, I don't, oh, there you go. Sam just put a link to it in there and we'll add that link to our slides as well. Um, so you'll have all the links because you have the slideshow link. Other questions? I really haven't had that many issues with the Canvas like downloads count. I mean, I'm not, I'm also not someone who does a lot of like micro assessment. Yeah, um, there's a conversation going on about Canvas, which I know is going to be one of our lightning talks talking about um, an L the LTI integration. Um, so yeah, I was aware that the stats can be misleading and it's particularly like, that's why we added the Google form uh, for students to fill out or for patrons to fill out once they take the um, modules um, to let us know what they think. And it also, I think, gives us a better idea of how many students are using them within Canvas. Um, you also don't know from the Canvas Commons analytics what is being done with the tutorials, but we created these to be really flexible with the idea of that if instructors are um, changing things up to be more specific to their discipline, that's up to them. So it defaults to a, um, and again, Rachel is the one who adds them into Canvas, um, but we have them be a graded quiz by default, right, Rachel? And then they can turn that off though and have it be ungraded or get rid of the quiz um, because the actual tutorials produce a certificate on the web platform through a UNCG login. And I would say if you're going to put them into your own LMS, I'm sort of, I would consider myself a Canvas power user. It only took me about 20 minutes. If you maybe weren't as comfortable, um, it could take you a little bit longer, but overall it's just copying and pasting into Canvas. Yeah, so someone asked, do you have a method of combining your use stats for Canvas Commons and your website? Um, we, we have the website stats. Um, we're working on publishing an article about our um, workflow, our collaborative workflow, and, and pretty much like what we just talked about, <laughs> just in, a, in an article form. Um, so the stats are in there. Um, and again, like I said, they match up pretty well 
Um, most modules being hit on around 100 to around 250 times. Um, again, the more popular ones being in the 200s, um, which again, for our campus is an FTE of around 18,000. Um, and some of them were released uh, right around the beginning of this fall with how quick we can push them out. Um, so yeah, and then um, someone asked um, about H5P and the WordPress plugin with security concerns. I met with um, some um, administrators in IT because I was the first person on our campus to ask for the plugin. Um, and uh, they looked at it and we haven't had any issues. We do have to keep it updated. That's been, I, I'm the one who does it on the back end. Uh, I have to update the plugin all the time to make it, uh, uh, it work. Um, but other than that, we haven't had any issues. Um, RIT approved it. We have a click rack process for anything like that, but open source things like that where we can just, uh, where it has a pretty clear message of use, usually our IT is fine with it. Um, so someone asked how um, is this impacting your face-to-face -face instruction? And Rachel um, just talked about that a little bit. Um, before COVID hit, um, I mean, we released these as a soft launch in January um, before COVID hit, and it was a soft launch. We were really just kind of like targeting certain classes to try them out in versus our older tutorials, um, seeing what people liked and didn't like. But then um, we really did a more full release this fall, which um, it's kind of hard to say, right, like how it would match up. But maybe a future assessment could see our older tutorials, how they would normally be used in the fall versus this fall. Um, but um, our face-to-face -face instruction was fully online this semester, um, and we did offer, depending on the liaison, synchronous and asynchronous modules. And again, like we mentioned, um, more than one liaison took these modules in Canvas Commons, right, because they're editable files, and adapted them to course learning objectives and their instruction. Because we also, and again, I think uh, Lindsay and uh, Michael are going to talk about this. We have the LTI integration in Canvas, and we have a librarian role in Canvas. We're heavily ingrained in Canvas at UNCG. So thank you so much, uh, Sam and Rachel. Yeah, sorry, I think we're done. <laughs> That's great. Uh, perfect timing. And uh, we're, our next presenter is Anders Tobiasen from Portland State University, presenting "Let's Tell a Story Using Narrative to Construct Accessibility." All right. I'm gonna start my thing. Here we go, subtitles are going. Um, I, just a second, I'm gonna mess around with the screen here. Um, I'm gonna drop into the chat a uh, link to my, if I can get it, my files. Um, and then I'm gonna get started. All right. Okay. Portland State University is located in the heart of downtown. So I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Sorry. Portland State University is located in the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon and Multnomah County. We aim to honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on. The Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wadlata Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapoya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we aim to honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. What sticks with you when you listen to a, or read a story? What kinds of details ensure that the world the story creates is complete and imaginable? When we teach information literacy, we are often asking students to engage in a world that's a bit unfamiliar to them. One of the ways we often help mitigate this is by using narrative techniques in our in-person teaching. Utilizing some basic narrative techniques in the creation of online video tutorials allows us to not only create, engage students creatively, but also add significant layers of accessibility. In this short presentation, I start with some of the theoretical cognitive background to narrative techniques and then explore a few concrete examples. Many years ago, I taught a student who's blind, and the lessons they imparted to me have informed my teaching practice ever since. A really important one was that following how to do a task was much easier if the story surrounding it was engaging and included direct causal relationships. This was a nascent version of the idea of creating a breadcrumb trail for students to follow. This inspired me to not only create online video tutorials that meet the baseline of ADA accessibility requirements, but go beyond them to think a little bit more creative, creatively about accessibility. Utilizing narrative techniques allows for enhanced accessibility by describing both how to do something, but also what the consequences of the doing are and why they are important. This describing in detail is vital. 
of course, but adding in storytelling creates these concrete moments of causality. This creates a trail of breadcrumb effects. Using narrative in education is a form of constructivist pedagogy. The key to narrative is a description of what happens during and as a result of an action, rather than just a static description of the thing itself. Instead of just illustrating a concept, the idea of telling a story allows us for us as creators to really connect with how we teach, rather than just what we teach. And using narrative fundamentally entails inviting the viewer and listener to participate in the task, rather than just passively receive the information. When we think about accessibility, we tend to think of things like closed captions, big enough images, describing exactly what's happening. And we think about UDL, we think about multiple learning paths and engaging students where they are. But when we add in narrative to our toolbox, we can bring additional cognitive constructs into play. We create a story that allows students to recreate the concept later for themselves. This trail of breadcrumbs has important cognitive implications. As Carlos Leon writes, quote, producing narratives is not only an ability that is more or less natural, but a specific topology for storing information, end quote. He then further clarifies the idea of narratives as creating information storage containers by stating that, quote, narrative objects are then created. Full narratives are then created from these narrative objects as constituents. Finally, narratives are the main elements of the narrative aware episodic memory and procedural semantic memory, end quote. Back to breadcrumbs. When we think about web accessibility, one of the main tenets is to create a semantic structure or logical document structure. Semantic structure means creating logical connections and steps between different pages or parts of a web page on the back end or code side. If we take this basic principle and sit with it for a little bit, it starts to sound a lot like narrative. In other words, what makes semantic structure so compelling from an accessibility standpoint are the causal connections between pages and objects that allow for any user, whether disabled or not, to just access them without major difficulties. So here are some ways to add narrative to your toolbox. The first step is to be explicit about how one interacts with resources. In this, using either we or you is the best way to initially engage, rather than I. A first-person narrative, while important in certain contexts, only serves here to suggest that only I, the expert librarian, can perform the task. Instead of, begin by searching for electric vehicle in the, in the library catalog, try, then type in some keywords, for instance, electric vehicle, into the general library search box and press enter or the search button. Even though the first is a bit narrative-like, Notice that causality is missing. There is nothing explicit about how to actually perform the search. In the second, the sentence invites the user, together along with the librarian, to search for electric vehicle using explicit instructions with causality built in. This is an actual example from the video I created for Portland State entitled Persistent Filters and Limiters. I wish I had time to play the whole video for you, but I included a link on the slides um, and that's in your chat. It will, also, it will have to be enough that I describe some of the storytelling elements. Stories always begin with a problem or stressor that needs some attention. In the video, the problem, as it were, is having to refilter search results every time one changes a keyword or does a new search. The video describes how to lock the filters, add a new keyword to the search box, and then finally run the search. But it's not enough to just describe the task. That's not a story. Rather, the key here is that the video details the effect of doing the tasks in this order. In other words, selecting the lock filter tool before changing a keyword helps keep the filters locked when running a new search. As the narrator states, the filter stayed with us when we changed our search terms. Awesome. One of the keys to using narrative to enhance accessibility is to use a story as a thread connecting the video as a whole, but also within discrete elements in the video. So for instance, I talk about excluding reviews from the search because we are looking for only peer reviewed articles, but the initial limiter is for peer reviewed journals which can contain reviews. This is where storyboarding and creating a script can be so useful. This allows you to write out causality and also to create threads that might run throughout. Being deliberate about this can be really helpful. Deliberately crafting the story, as it were, allows us to make explicit causal connections between concepts. This, in turn, allows a more semantic structure to sign through. What it all comes back to is reproducibility, which plays a key role in broad accessibility. Narrative techniques engage the cognitive functions that create reproducibility. We all tell stories. It's one of the main ways we interact with the world. So tell a story, construct the narrative, and you might be surprised at just how accessibility becomes a natural part of your video creation process. Thank you. And now I'm gonna look at the chat and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen.
Actually, Anders, could you yeah. share your screen again so we can keep captions running for the Q&A? Oh, sure. Yes, just a second. Awesome. We'll share this one right here. There you go. Um, Perfect. Let me find the chat. I do. They're on the... Um, uh, so do I have a list of sources? So they are on the, a couple of the sources are on the slides. And then I actually have, um, I can send along a more comprehensive bibliography, but I also have a chapter coming out in a new ACRL book um, called Once Upon a Time in the Library, um, which has a, a, a couple more sources in it as well. Um, does that do I write a script or do I just wing it? I, I write scripts. Um, I, I am not comfortable usually winging much of anything. I come from a background, um, uh, and I'll answer Tessa's in just a second, but I just, uh, I come from a background in the humanities and, and specifically music theory where uh, you literally write out every single word that you're going to present. Um, and a lot of the words specifically when you're teaching too, you kind of memorize it. Um, so it, that's my background. And so I tend to be very careful about the words I use, or at least I attempt to be. Um, so do I have any tips draw, for drawing on students' lived experience for script writing? Yeah, so one of the things I do a lot is I spend a lot of time um, at the reference desk, or at least I used to. I spend a lot of time in reference chat these days. Um, but I like to draw on my experiences with what students struggle with and with what I see there to create the kinds of scripts and the kinds of narratives that I try to use in my um, in my in my teaching or in my in my online video tutorial stuff. Um, so I really do draw on, and I actually take notes sometimes after an interaction, um, just to give myself a reminder of what I what what I, what might help me in the in the future to create a more like yeah more accessible. Uh, since I started using narrative as a means in have you seen other areas where narrative could help make processes more clear? I think telling a story oh, it makes processes more clear in a lot of places, um, mostly because I think when we begin to think about the ways in which we all interact with the world, most of us remember how to do something by the stories we tell around it. Um, and so that means that using, using you know, the narrative idea sort of informs a lot of the ways in which I engage with teaching and with teaching research and with doing research. Um, so has narrative accessibility, sorry, I'm gonna try to go through these quickly because I know I don't have much time. Has narrative accessibility in videos increased viewership? Um, yeah, um, we have a hard time tracking viewership. We use YouTube um, and we promote our libguides and we think we know what's going on in terms of, um, uh, we think we know how much it's going on, but it's, it, since I changed, I did, I redid all the videos uh, about two years ago, and we've seen a, a big intake, uptick in their overall viewership since they were redone. Whether that's due to using narrative as an accessibility tool or not, I have no idea. But they definitely have been more used since we redid them. How similar is narrative, the idea of narrative to narrative-based qualitative research for not, um, how do I recommend getting started? <laughs> um, uh, so uh, one of the things, um, narrative-based qualitative research, so I have a colleague who does a lot of this like storytelling, uh, stories, storying, um, and that they're different in the sense that one is a research method and narrative in constructive pedagogy is a kind of way in which you use storytelling techniques to try to encourage students to learn things in their own manner. Um, so it's, a, it's definitely a little bit different. Oh, Renee, thank you so much. That is really great. Yeah, I actually um, used a couple of those sources uh, on that. All right, so great. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to be done because it looks like we're on time, but thank you so much. And please let me know if you have more questions and I'll try to get to them as I can. Thanks so much, Anders. 
All right, our next presenter is Natalie Haber from the University of Tennessee Chattanooga presenting Assessing the Efficacy of the Tutorial, an in-depth analysis of student source evaluations. Okay, can you guys see my screen all right and the captions okay? Yes, we can. Yep. All right, thanks. Okay, yeah, so assessing the efficacy of the tutorial, right? So this is all about um, doing some in-depth analysis of student source um, evaluations, um, which is some research that I'm, it's kind of ongoing, um, but I'm, I was working on mostly in the spring last year. So, hey, I'm Natalie Haber. I'm the online services librarian over at uh, UTC. Um, if you want to follow up with me later on, you're welcome to email me. My information is right there. Um, so just to run down really quick, this is a freshman composition course tutorial for the second part of their um, composition class. Uh, the tutorial comprised of several different sections. So there was a couple of videos on source types and characteristics, um, a video about evaluating sources for credibility and bias, which um, I don't know if anybody here is from NCSU. It's actually their credibility video. I borrowed it. Um, practice evaluating sources. So I gave the students um, a scholarly source to take a look at. It's a PDF. I gave them a PDF of uh, a New York Times article, which will be the, the bit I'm talking about today, um, and an organizational website. And they were asked to evaluate it based on whether or not they thought it was credible or uh, what, what the bias was. Um, then they're given a GIF about how to find the research guides and um, a couple of little more tutorial about using the databases and they got some practice. So um, 300 uh, submissions over four semesters. And what I did was a, a coding of the, the language used in their evaluations of the sources. So um, I'm just gonna jump into the popular source evaluations and because I, I don't have enough time today to get through all the other um, information about the organizational website or the scholar, the scholarly source. But, um, and, and this is the more interesting thing, right? What do students think about the New York Times right now in Tennessee? Okay, so there are some things at work here beyond um, what I can teach them. So here was the article. Um, all the articles that they were given had to do with um, student binge drinking in college. So this piece is called Britain's New Puritan Youth Drinking Falls Dramatically. Um, I've only just given you guys a snippet. The students did have access to the entire article. Um, but you can see it's a kind of a mixture of interview. Um, and down here at the bottom is um, a WHO study from 2002 comparing to another similar study in 2014. So 99% of students were able to correctly identify this as a popular source. So I'm doing something right, right? And then here's where it gets interesting. 42% said that it was not credible. 55% said it was credible. Again, this is a news report um, and it was pretty lengthy. So 42% saying not credible. This is why I was like, I need to delve in and really read why. Um, so out of that 42%, 17% said it had many facts but does not have any sources. So I would say no. So 17% of students said the New York Times didn't have any sources, even though we can see that it's quoting personal interview and it's quoting from that WHO statistic. Um, so, or that WHO study done. So I think, um, you know, a takeaway here is that they're misunderstanding um, that source characteristic, like what is the expectation? Are they really expecting a reference list at the end? That's kind of problematic, right? So um, that gives me pause, like how am I, how should I teach this better? 13% said no because of bias. No, because the New York Times is a biased source that is known for posting articles with incorrect facts and blurred truths. So I've, I'm just pulling quotes that really capture the essence of what these students were saying. I mean, there was a few that said, no, the New York Times is fake news, right? So I think this to me pushed me in that direction of, I, whether we want it to be or not, the New York Times has been harmed over the last four years of rhetoric toward it. And maybe it's not a good example to bring into the classroom right this minute, it's too charged. So um, I did choose to move away from the New York Times um, and have them evaluate a Baltimore Sun article in the newest reiteration of this tutorial um, to maybe avoid some of that knee jerk reaction. Um, 
6% said author, this is hilarious, right? You'll love this. I would not consider this source credible because the author has no credibility besides the fact that she works at the New York Times. There are no credentials. Um, so again, a misunderstanding of um, what is journalism? What is this field of professional writing? Um, and what is a good indicator of um, whether or not someone's good at it or, or you know, I think that's a really interesting thing that's difficult to teach that we maybe gloss over a bit. 3% said it's not credible because it's not peer reviewed. So I would not consider this credible because it comes from a popular media outlet that, and it is not peer reviewed. It does not peer review its articles, right? So again, this I'm less concerned with, you know, if students want to err towards peer review for their sources, like I'm not going to stop them. Um, but again, it comes back to like reading the assignment details. Yes, you can use a New York Times article for um, your English composition course, you know, maybe not for your for, for later on in your degree, depending on your degree, though. So. All right. So when it came on the other side, those that thought it was credible pointed to um, trust in the publication. So, yes, because they are a respected news source. Um, so you know, that's a knee jerk reaction on the other element. Maybe it's interesting when it comes to that, uh, you know, publication uh, recognition and how, how do we teach that? I don't know, just keep telling them to read more, right? 19% yes, because of citations. So yes, the author used multiple sources to back up facts. So this is indicating that a good 19% of them took the time to read it um, enough to see that, yeah, there are sources in there. 7% said yes, because it's published recently. I find this one actually to be a troubling statistic because 7% pointing to recent, um, when date is so flexible, depending on the topic being ta uh, talked about, that I think that does make me really reconsider using things like the crap test because this article isn't credible because it was published in 2018. That's one small element. There, the other elements kind of, I think, should have been called out bigger. You know, the, these students, these 7%, like that was all they said. It was because of date, it was recent. All right, 3% said, yes, um, I think it is credible. The author is a professional, right? Something about the author being credible. So the tutorial improvements looked like um, a longer source types video, which um, I now have called source types and function within research. So. Um, taking a much deeper dive into journalism. The video went from three minutes to eight minutes. People have been watching it, so that's good. It just turns out it's a bigger topic. I can't get it into three minutes. It, I need more time. And you know what? You're in college. So you're going you're gonna to watch my eight-minute video on source types. Um, additional information about evaluating sources. So I added in um, a graphic about the SIFT uh, method, right? Um, and then... Uh, more questions, teasing out uh, what do you, definitions of evaluating, and so you know, really force them to really um, think through with the questions that I asked. We switched to the Baltimore Sun article, and then this is another really. I think this change is going to work really well, or I've seen it working really well. Rather than say, "Is this credible? Yes or no," and tell me why, I put credibility and bias on a scale of one to five. So. On a scale of one to five, how credible do you think this is, allows for students to really explore that gray area um, a little bit more thoroughly. Um, so come, coming up next time, I really need to improve how I'm approaching instruction on the organizational website. That's still, students are still struggling with that. So that'll be kind of what I'm up to next. So I will turn it over to questions now, and I'm gonna go ahead and try to open the chat because um, I haven't yet. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm gonna mute myself for just a second because you guys have been talking a bit. Sorry. I don't know if one of the other moderators could call out a question. Let's see. Oh, what were the responses from the Baltimore Sun? Okay, Amber, I got your question here. Um, the the what we did with the Baltimore Sun article this time, instead of using an informational report we went with an opinion piece and it was actually a really terrible piece. So um, it was very biased. And um, the author was like from, they were like the CEO of some organization with political ties. Anyway, 
um, students did really well with the Baltimore Sun article. They like identified the bias and they said they wouldn't use it. So I was, I was pretty impressed with that. Okay, Matt, I don't know if I've skipped anyone's questions, but I'm down at Matt's question about prioritizing which changes to make, especially given the challenge of the past six months. Honestly, I just had it in my head that over the summer, I was gonna just like overhaul the tutorial. And um, for the most part, like every section of the tutorial had some kind of tweak, but this time, since I wasn't gonna be the only one assigning it, normally I was just teaching all the online sections. Um, I actually like kind of forced my colleagues to get in there and you know, really uh, pull it apart and give me a second set of eyes, which was really helpful um, in all the changes. Oh, can you share the link to your slides? Yes, I can do that. And um, yeah, let me grab my slide deck. A lot of discussion here, Natalie, about um, professors at institutions only allowing scholarly sources and encouraging librarians uh, to use scholarly sources rather than news articles. If you have any other input on that, I'm sure the audience would welcome it. Um, well, I, you know, honestly, I teach for, I'm the liaison to political science, and they are all about using high quality news as sources in addition to peer reviewed sources. Um, so I don't tend to see that as an issue as much. Like, I don't have faculty that are strictly saying um, peer reviewed only, um, but, I, but I do know it, it's out, out there. You know, I think it all depends on what department. And yeah, I think. Um, when Aaron's asking, do I see any changes about the way that faculty discuss news? I don't know. I've just, I've, I've heard a lot of chatter about how um, professors are like concerned with all sorts of, you know, you know, how are these students interacting with these media, you know? So um, here's my slide deck. Oh, okay, so Mary Michelle Moore is asking about how we did the scale. <laughs> Why does it, all, with, with these scales, it's so difficult, right? Okay, so, but yeah, we ended up, I think we said on a scale of one to five with one being the least credible and five being the most credible, where would you put this and why? And then I think it was a sim something similar with biased. So I think the words we used were um, one being, uh, too, unbi too biased to use and five being unbiased. Now, a couple of students mixed them up, um, but we were able to like kind of sort it out afterwards. Now that is something that is really difficult. You can't make LibWizard grade it for you, right? Cause it's not a yes or a no. Um, so that is something you wanna consider if you're trying to get the system to do a lot of grading for you. Thanks so much, Natalie. Yep. All right, so our last presenters today are Lindsay Wharton and Michael Pritchard from Florida State University, who will be presenting three years together, examining our library's LTI integrations in Canvas. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you to the Dolls Instruction Committee for hosting this event and for everyone for taking the time to be here. So we're gonna be talking about our library is experienced integrating um, in our Canvas instance, and we've been doing it for three years now. So it's kind of an overview and reflection back on what we've done. My name is Lindsay Warden, and I'm presenting with my colleague, Michael Pritcher. We're from Florida State University Libraries. So just starting out with a little history. Um, we decided very early on, sort of like looking at distance services at the library, we wanted to focus on the LMS. The LMS allows seamless integration of resources and services right in the online learning space. So bringing the library to students and to instructors. 
We plan multi-tier integrations for the launch of our Canvas in 2017. Um, I've done other presentations talking about how we got into Canvas from the ground up, and that's been part of our success. We were really able to envision how the library would work in Canvas as we were planning our Canvas instance along with the entire campus. One of our integrations is we do have a student and instructor library course, and it automatically enrolls all FSU users. So our instructor course has about 2,800 students in the course, um, and our student course has over 42,000 students in our course. But our most successful integration by far, and the one we're gonna be talking about today, is our SpringShare LTI integrated subject specific library tools, where we created 60 libguides, which we automatically populate into course sites based on course code. So there's a picture of what the library tool looks like. It's a screenshot from a Canvas course site. Um, you'll see there's a library tool link and this is what comes up. One of the things we did starting out is we created simple and standardized library tool templates in place of using our existing libguides. We saw examples of other institutions that had used their existing libguides and we tested this out and it did not work well. Our libguides look and work very, very differently. Some have tabs, some have different navigation structures. Um, and when you're integrating something into a course site, a lot of times it doesn't look the same as it would look from libguides. So we really wanted to create a one page and use HTML to do most of the coding and have it look the same for every single library tool. So the same links, um, we worked very closely with the subject librarians to integrate a picture, the contact information, and select four to six uh, top sources for that department or that subject or that course. This also required a good amount of technical work with our SpringShare administrators in the libraries. We had to sort of turn on the AutoMagic implementation, make sure we had the different SpringShare account settings to make this work, but even more work was liaising with our Office of Distance Learning. Um, they are the ones who administrate our Canvas instance. And so it was a lot of work there uh, on the back end to make sure we could turn on that integration in Canvas as well and work out a lot of the kinks. So in the end, we ended up with over 60 libguides populated into our course sites with resources and library links that we really wanted to be relevant even from like brand new students to more seasoned students. Um, that was available on and off campus and no extra work from instructors. So automatically populated into every course site. And I'm gonna hand it over to Michael. He's gonna talk a little bit about usage. Thanks, Lindsay. So we've been running our LTA integrations for about three years now. And in this chart, you can see each of those years usage rates overlaid across an academic calendar running from July to June. And this gives us some pretty good information just at a first glance. We can see that our highest levels of usage come at the same times that our students are being enrolled into their Canvas courses here in September, in January, and then a slight bump in April for our summer courses. This informs us that all of our work with student engagement needs to happen in Canvas at the same time and that we're getting all the engagement with our library tools in Canvas. You can see here on our next slide, this shows what our top five tools were for the past three academic years in Canvas. And the, probably the most important thing to note from this is just the occurrence of the high enrollment and high drop rate classes, such as our introduction to English classes and our freshman science courses like biology and computer science. This, also, this kind of informs us to let us know that because these students are using the LTI tools in their Canvas courses, we can develop further tools to coincide with our LTI tool to help increase our retention rate, to help reduce that drop rate and to help get students who might otherwise not ever come into the library physically or learn at a distance and thus never come into the library because of their degree program to get a feel for what we offer digitally and to help cultivate that library space. We've done some data analysis both with our Office of Distance Learning and within the library ourselves. You can see on the left, it's a question that was posed in the survey asking how often they use library resources within Canvas. And about 50% of our students report using those LTI tools at least once a semester with about 20% reporting using them weekly or even daily. 
This is mirrored, of course, on the right. You can see about 33% of students report using the library tools link in their course this past spring with 66% presenting no. What does this take away from us? We know that more distance users, about 45%, are using library resources in Canvas as opposed to our general population, which is about 33%. And that's a similar percentage as reported by our instructors and TAs. This tells Lindsay and I and the rest of our team that more of our content is geared towards students and specifically distance learners. So that informs us that we need to come up with innovative and like Anders was talking about, those more narrative-based techniques for engaging students with the work that we do. We know too, kind of like how Samantha was talking about, our view counts are consistently going up and we've had about 450,000 total views, but one of our next steps is to integrate how we can use a link tracking software like bit.ly or tiny.cc to more accurately engage how students are engaging with our library tools, what things they're using, and to get those more deeper level analytics. However, the LTI tools have served as a first step for us to move forward. As you can see on the left, this is a copy of the Strozier Scoop. It's an FSU library newsletter that Lindsay and I and our OPS launched this fall semester. And it gives kind of an overview as to what's going on in the library, what kind of things are happening and what sorts of resources and services are being highlighted in the semester based off of that usage chart from the first analytics slide. We send this out through Canvas using the announcement tool to those enrolled courses that Lindsay was talking about. And we're excited in this coming spring to see what the reaction has been to do some data analysis and hopefully report back on that. So to close with some tips for some long term relationship success with our LTIs, probably the first and I think Lindsay would agree is that this partnership would not have happened without the pre existing partnerships we already have with our Office of Distance Learning and our fellow subject librarians. We strengthen those partnerships. We inform them as the benefit of the students and how the, our students and instructors would benefit from using LTI in Canvas. And because of that, we believe that that's why we've had such a successful relationship over the past three years. Lindsay? Yeah, and just to build off that, um, I we started this project sort of seeing this as a one and done big project. And in fact, uh, one of the big takeaways that we've had is that this type of work in the LMS, um, maintaining these tools and our other integrations as resources change, personnel change, you, it's really crucial to reposition LMS work as central to distance library services work. Um, this is the online classroom, the digital learning space, making sure libraries are present and engaged in this space is such a fantastic way to reach users. And just sort of ending on the thought that online library space is as crucial as physical library space. I think if anything, this past year with COVID has taught us that. And so we're continuing to make a case for that and continuing to make a case of the work that we're doing in the online space is almost or just as important. So now I think we're closing out and we're happy to take questions. So I saw one earlier from Sam saying that for um, your LTI, we found a decrease in usage. Um, we're assuming it has to do with COVID. Has FSC found any dips? So it was funny, actually, prepping for these slides was the first time I was looking at our usage. And this semester, um, I think we are seeing a little bit of a dip. It's hard to tell right now, um, but we have also seen dips in our Google Analytics from our website as well. So overall, I think the answer is yes. It's really interesting actually why we're seeing that. I know that our enrollment numbers are not down at Florida State, so, uh, but I think we're experiencing the same thing. Jennifer, I see your question asking for the example of one of the guides that gets put in the course. So I backtracked here on our slide to this approach. This is actually what the guide looks like. We build it um, in LibWizard and it gets automatically populated in, but this is exactly what we build. They all look very similar. Um, it's just three columns in HTML with, like Lindsay said, the contact info. We have an embed for our Ask a Librarian tool and then those top uh, research sources. Um, give me, yeah, I see it's too small. Give me one second and I'll make it larger. If Lindsay, you wanna take another question? Sure, I'm just reading through about the other LTI integrations. We also did the EBSCO curriculum builder, didn't have a great experience with that once again, because um, we had some issues with the inter 
interface. We have done films on demand. We've seen a little bit of um, usage, but really not that much. And so we thought about integrating different tools, but we've more relied just on these integrations and including tools and different things just on, on our library tools since they've been so popular and students are also getting more and more used to using them. Oh, I see. Are your students just always enrolled in the library course or just once? So yeah, our the newsletter that Michael um, presented at the end, that the way that we actually disseminate that newsletter is we use the announcements in our course that enrolls all students because all students are always enrolled in that course. So it's a way for us to reach pretty much all of our students right through Canvas. They get like the Canvas pop-up announcement and then they click and it goes to our newsletter that lives within the course. I see Amy's question asking, do we have both a library tool and a LibGuide for our subjects? Um, I'll let Lindsay answer a little bit more, but the short answer is yes. And I think there's a multitude of reasons for that. Um, we don't allow our subject our librarians, I say allow, that sounds very controlling, but we don't really give them access to edit the Canvas LTI guides. And the primary reason behind that is because we want to make sure that we can manage the look in every guide, right? Like she said, we wanna make sure when students go from course to course, Canvas course to Canvas course, their library tool LTI link has the same look. So if they figure out how to use it in one course, they know it's gonna be used in another course, but they do, our subject librarians and liaisons do maintain their own guides, right, Lindsay? Yes. Um, they do. So yeah, we had tested it out trying to import uh, the guides and it did not work well. And that's why we decided we were going to create these separate guides. They don't show up if you go to like our guides.lib.fsu.edu page, they're not showing up in that list of guides. Um, and we make sure never to call them libguides on the tool. We're trying to very much differentiate and not confuse students that these are libguides. We never call them libguides in any of the literature or anything. And one of the most prominent links on the library tool is, hey, if you'd like to visit the full libguide, click here. Yeah, I saw another question asking about the popularity of this. I've actually found that our subject librarians really enjoy that. It's mostly myself and my OPS that do these updates. I email them every semester. I have a working spreadsheet to keep track of who is in charge of what subject area. And I just ask them, do they have any updates to their top resources? Has contact information changed? Do they have a new headshot? Anything else they want showcased? And they don't have to do any of the effort other than responding to my email. And I think they seem to enjoy that. Yeah, we were at first, I think there was a lot of like questions about how would this work and you know who would control this. But once it was implemented, I, I, we haven't had any problems at all. I'm completely supported. They work well with us. And yeah, like I said, it's kind of been on our team to make sure everything is updated. So less work for the subject librarians. And I see a question. Yeah, that just came in about how much time to build and sustain. The building took a good amount of time. Matching the course codes is something that we have to do continually as well as at your institutions too. Uh, course codes probably change. That's how we match guides. Um, so we have to make sure go through and change those. We have to communicate with the subject librarians if any of the resources change, links change. Like we just changed up our citation management links. We had to go into every guide and change that. It's hard to estimate like how many times, I mean, but it's definitely become more and more positioned at the center of our of, yeah. of our jobs. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say it probably is 15 to 25% of my job is maintaining our LTI integrations. Um, I, there's a question about which classes have their own library tool and which ones have a subject library tool. Um, it's kind of on a case by case basis. Each department and course code has one. Right, so English has a guide for all English courses. Um, theater has a guide for all theater courses. Music has a guide for music. We do get some instructors and in some departments that ask, for example, our college, we have a college of business guide that is specifically crafted for the college of business. They asked for one to be separate from any of their courses so they could also showcase a few things that their college offers. Um, we have one specifically for ENC 2135 that is an ENC 2135 specific guide that is totally separate from our general English guide. 
So it really is kind of on a case by case basis right now. It is for sure. And it's just different. Um, but I think that we're out of time. It's at three. So I just want to thank everyone for coming and for asking so many great questions. Thank you so much, Lindsay and Michael. And thank you to all of our, our presenters today and all in attendance. Uh, we hope you're leaving here with some new ideas that you can run with at your own institutions. Um, hope everybody stays safe. And uh, please, before you leave, please fill out an event evaluation. You'll find the link in the chat. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good one.